Um, thank you for coming. I um, apologize to people who have to stand um, that we don't have more seats, but we very much appreciate your being here. I'm Michael Green, uh, Senior Vice President for Asia at CSIS and Japan Chair, and a professor at Georgetown. And we're joined today by a distinguished group of um, members of the National Diet of Japan, representing um, uh, three of the major parties, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, the Democratic Party of Japan, and uh, New Kome. And we have an opportunity today to go into more uh, detail about the defense guidelines, um, collective self-defense, um, and the issues that were um, highlighted earlier this week by the um, 2 plus 2 meeting between US and, and, and Japanese uh, foreign and defense officials and by the summit meeting uh, between Prime Minister Obama and President, Prime Minister uh, Abe and President Obama, and then of course the congressional presentation. So we've divided um, into two panels, and I will um, moderate this first panel, um, and then my friend um, uh, Sunohara-san from Nikkei will moderate the second panel. This panel will focus on uh, the domestic politics and the homework uh, Japan has now, because many of the agreements that were discussed this week have to be put into law. Um, uh, and as I understand it, that, those laws will be submitted um, in about two weeks. Um, so uh, we're going to learn about what might happen when the rubber hits the road, when um, these U.S.-Japan agreements and announcements are put to the vote in the Diet. And I'm going to ask my colleagues about um, the domestic political context, how each of their parties views the um, new defense reforms and related legislation, and also uh, ask what it means um, for relations with other countries in Asia. Do those countries have um, adequate understanding of what this means? Are there opportunities for expanding cooperation with neighboring countries? So those are the themes we'll cover in this panel. And in the next panel, uh, Sunohara-san would be joined by Professor Kitoka and Professor Morimoto to talk about um, uh, the um, policy and strategy trajectory overall for the alliance going forward. So I'm joined by um, uh, some of the most important um, members of the Diet um, who will, in fact, be on point um, uh, shepherding um, or attacking <laughs> this legislation as it moves forward. All, all very strong supporters of uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance and the U.S.-Japan relationship. Um, Takeshi Iwaya, to my right, is a member of the House of Representatives from the LDP and a leading figure in the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committees of the Party and the Diet. Um, Seiji Maihara, uh, this is the list uh, here. So Seiji Maihara, a former uh, foreign minister under the uh, Democratic Party of Japan government, a member of the House of Representatives. Um, and uh, Onodera-san, Itsunori Onodera, former Minister of Defense uh, under the Abe cabinet and a senior member of the LDP and the, and the Diet. Um, and uh, Akihisa Nagashima, um, former National Security Advisor and Vice uh, Defense Minister under the uh, NOTA cabinet of the Democratic Party of Japan and a, a prominent member um, and leader on those issues now on the Diet. And uh, Isamu Ueda, uh, a veteran of the uh, lower House of the Diet, a member of New Kome, and a key opinion leader on foreign affairs, defense uh, issues in particular. So we have um, really the best group we could assemble in Washington um, to begin to understand what will happen next, uh, or not, at least understand what, what the different views on for what should happen next. And I'd like to open up by asking first about the legislative process and the politics of collective self-defense of the new defense guidelines um, in Nagatacho, in the Diet, and in Japan. Um, and let me, um, uh, uh, let me start first um, with um, Iwaya-san, um, who will have a key role in um, uh, shepherding some of this legislation through to tell us what the LDP's view is and what some of the political considerations are within Japan. I am uh, Takeshi Iwaya from the LDP. Prime Minister Abe just made a, uh, an address to the joint uh, a joint session of Congress. It's only been a couple of days. 
at this um, moment to be able to come to CSIS and participate in a seminar such as this in the afterglow of uh, the Prime Minister's visit is something that I'm uh, most pleased about. This opportunity was uh, made possible by uh, Mr. Sunohara of Nikkei and uh, President uh, Hamri of CSS and others and uh, donors. Um, my gratitude to you all. Within the LDP, for a long time, I was the head of the uh, study committee on security. At present, uh, the uh, security legislation to be delivered in the diet with the uh, coalition partner, the COMETO. I have been in these uh, coordinating talks. We're pretty much uh, in agreement, but uh, I have participated in those uh, talks. There's not much time. Prime Minister Abe, what has he done in order to um, shore up our uh, security uh, structure? The guidelines, revision, security legislation, is this the very first thing that we No, over two years? We have done various uh, things taken various measures in order to strengthen our security structure. First of all, we uh, created a National Security Council for the first time in Japan. And we created a national security strategy. And the key word in it is proactive contributions to peace. Based on this strategy, the uh, National Defense Program uh, guidelines, which are created uh, every uh, 10 years, we uh, revise them. And then the midterm defense program, which is created every five years, we also revised them. So it's not much, but we did increase our defense budget by 1.8%. And then the three in principles on the export of arms. Uh, we created uh, in their place uh, the three uh, principles for the transfer of uh, uh, weapons. And this uh, attempt had begun in the uh, Democratic Party of Japan uh, administration. But what we have done is to go about making the rules more clear. It was quite a domestic uh, debate that surrounded this, but we also uh, passed the law on the protection of special secrets. Based on all of this, finally, we will uh, go about uh, creating our security legislation, which will uh, secure all of these things. Professor Kitaoka and others advise the uh, government. And so based on that uh, discussion on uh, security uh, legislation, we have um, been making preparations. And we want to make seamless uh, legislation. When we talk about the US-Japan uh, Guidelines. There's uh, cooperation in peacetime, and then there are situations that could have a serious effect on Japan, and then U.S. Japan cooperation in that context, and then situations that threaten international peace, and U.S. Jap Japan cooperation that happens then. And stepping it up further, there is U.S. Japan cooperation in the face of an armed attack against Japan. Even if Japan is not directly attacked, if there's attack on the United States, a very serious effect could be uh, uh, exerted on Japan, and then we would uh, have different cooperation for that, and then cooperation in disasters. So we want to create legislation that uh, can cover all of these situations uh, seamlessly, and based on the draft that we have been coordinating with the Komeito, we'd like to submit legislation to the Diet in mid-May. As the Prime Minister said in his speech, it's just a target, but 
uh, we would really like to have the legislation passed uh, by this summer. What is the purpose of all of this? It's to strengthen deterrence. But uh, people sometimes uh, criticize Prime Minister Abe as moving too far to the right or being perhaps militaristic. I would say rather that he is being very realistic and balanced. The security environment surrounding Japan has uh, shifted dramatically based on that. Strengthening and maintaining deterrence is extremely realistic, I think. I think that uh, this is the sort of approach that any uh, party taking power would uh, likely take. I am concerned, though, that in the U.S. Uh, there might be uh, maybe slightly too high expectations. And in neighboring countries, there might be uh, too much concern. So I do worry about that. So we will have to explain careful, carefully to get understanding from the international community. I'll uh, leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Um, the last point is an interesting one because the temptation is to say this is a great historic change, but it's not really so great and historic. Um, uh, it is uh, certainly historic in the context of U.S.-Japan relations. Um, uh, Maihara san, uh, the proposal to review and revise the defense guidelines was made when uh, DPJ was in power uh, by, um, by Ms., uh, Mr. Morimoto, who was defense minister, and the discussion on collective self-defense also began. When, when you were in government, is this um, legislation and this process, is this moving in the direction that you anticipated? What do you think um, the views will be in Japan when the prime minister comes home and has to convince people to support this in the diet? Good afternoon. Mai Hara from the DPJ. Uh, next uh, Foreign Minister Nagashima. I don't know if he'll actually be the next Foreign Minister, but next Foreign Minister Nagashima is with me on the uh, dais here. So I'll leave the uh, expert uh, level discussion to him. We also have Koichiro Gemba, former Foreign Minister, and Deputy uh, CCS uh, Fukuyama. And Kishimoto Shuhei and Tamaki Yujiro, who were in the Ministry of Finance. I'd just like to um, point them out. First of all, my thanks to Nikkei, CSIS, and the uh, donors. My heartfelt uh, gratitude. So, um, Mr. Green has just said something, but let me uh, give you some background on the, that. The guidelines were revised 18 years ago in 1997. But actually, it was the Chisasa uh, government, the LDP, uh, SDP, and Sakigake uh, coalition that had created the f uh, foundation for that. And I was, uh, we were involved in that. So what's slightly different this time? It's that we revised the guidelines in resp response to specific needs, mainly two. One, in 1994, North Korea was engaged in nuclear development. And the, there was an option of aerial bombardment. And how much could the Japan cooperate with the United States? This was very behind the scenes, these consultations. So, there were some uh, specific requests that came uh, to uh, Japan in a, a, a very uh, specific way uh, since the end of the war. Our answer was that we could do nothing. So 
what uh, North Korea could do might uh, affect uh, Japan in a life or death manner. And if our ally, the U.S., were to do something about it, Japan couldn't help at all. This became clear. And so that uh, led to the um, law on situations and areas uh, surrounding Japan and cooperation in peacetime and in wartime and uh, situations in areas surrounding Japan. So we created those three pillars then. Another thing was that there was the Okinawa base issue. In 1995, there uh, was a rape uh, by a U.S. service member. And uh, you know that the uh, uh, alliance is not symmetrical. Uh, Japan uh, is not responsible for defending the United States when attacked, whereas the U.S. is responsible for uh, defending Japan. Uh, Japan uh, simply uh, provides facilities and areas. So it's uh, Article 5 and Article 6 that are not uh, symmetrical. But to reduce the burden of bases on Okinawa, the highest uh, priority was returning uh, Futama Air Station. In 1996, Rujaro Hashimoto, the prime minister of the time, in deciding the return of Futama Air Base, along with reducing the burden on Okinawa. Uh, he said that we should uh, deepen uh, U.S.-Japan cooperation in terms of uh, action. It's been 18 years since then. The strategic environment has greatly changed. We have uh, uh, new guidelines, and we're about to try to create new security legislation. I think it's important to do, but the present uh, revision, was it really done in response to specific needs? I think that is very much open to question. So Prime Minister Abe, I think, has to told his uh, staff, uh, let's do everything that can be done. As um, uh, uh, Mr. Yuawei just said, we don't want the uh, U.S. to have too high expectations. I am uh, concerned about that as well. It's precisely because I think the U.S.-Japan alliance is important that I am concerned about that. I think there are three important things. One is needs. Is there really a need? In the security legislation, collective self-defense or uh, protection of U.S. naval vessels in peacetime. Is there a need for that? Yes, I think so. But is everything that's being done right now uh, in response to a specific need? I uh, think that is uh, open to question. Second, the uh, capabilities and uh, equipment and structure of the self-defense forces will we actually be able to have them um, carry all of this out? I think that's very much open to question. The third point is the understanding of the public. I think that the term public diplomacy is very important, but diplomacy cannot be done without the understanding of the public. The sit law on situations in areas surrounding Japan is now uh, being called uh, the uh, important uh, effects law. It uh, does away with the effect uh, with the uh, regional uh, uh, element. But how do we define all these things? 18 years ago, we created the, the guidelines. What uh, exact uh, cooperation would we be able to do with the United States? There was an annex that showed this, but this hasn't been done this time either. And I think that that is uh, creating a lot of anxiety among the public. 
And so I think that we're, it's, it's a big package that no one knows uh, the, the details of what's in it. And it might uh, raise expectations too much in the U.S. and it might actually hurt the U.S. And, uh, alliance. And so I think that what needs to be done is to have a uh, full debate in the Diet about uh, any is possible issues. So uh, we, in our uh, DPJ government, uh, gave great importance to the U.S.-Japan alliance. That uh, perspective had not changed at all. And it's because uh, of our concerns about the sustainability of the alliance that we are mentioning uh, these uh, topics. Now, on, uh, in the press, I saw that uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe said something like that the guidelines are directed at uh, China and uh, North Korea. If that's true, I think that's uh, very much a problem. 18 years ago. Let me add a bit. Actually, uh, China and uh, South Korea uh, expressed concerns. The Soviet Union had collapsed. The U.S.-Japan uh, security alliance was no longer needed, according to them. And even though that's the case, you're strengthening it? Are you going to direct this alliance at China or at South Korea? At the time, our government uh, very carefully explained the uh, purpose of our alliance. Now, if uh, Prime Minister Abe said such a thing, I think that would be very much a diplomatic uh, problem that uh, would not help uh, the United States either, I don't think. I haven't checked this, but uh, it's just what I saw in the press. We have to bear all of this in mind, I think. The U.S.-Japan uh, alliance is a vital relationship. In order for our cooperation to progress, I think we have to carefully take the three steps that I mentioned earlier. And that's what I'd like to keep in mind as we discuss the guidelines and uh, security legislations in the diet. People um, argue that these days uh, the casting vote always comes to Komeito <laughs> because of its position in the coalition. I won't ask you to make your casting vote, but uh, wait a second, can you tell us how these are, uh, issues are viewed um, in your party and how you, how you see them? You've worked on foreign policy and defense for uh, uh, at least 20 years by my count, so please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, First of all, I'm very uh, honored to be able to give an uh, opportunity to give my presentation uh, at this, uh, with the distinguished guest. Uh, and um, uh, I uh, am the member uh, of the House of Representatives belonging to uh, Kome Party, yeah, as, just, as Mr. Green has mentioned. Um, the Kome Party is in coalition with the Liberal Democratic Party and has been in coalition for 15 years now, uh, except for the three years that we, both of us were in the, the opposition. Um, I have been a member uh, of the discussion group of the coalition parties on reviewing and development of the security legislation uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Iwaya. Uh, so I would like to comment on the, the outline of the security related bills uh, that will be presented uh, in the, uh, to the Diet in the, couple of, uh, in the coming couple of weeks. Uh, the discussion group has met over uh, 20 times uh, since last April uh, and has reached a basic consensus uh, which was authorized as a cabinet decision uh, in last July the 1st. Uh, the group has resumed the discussion this spring and has reached a de facto agreement on the contents of the necessary bills uh, just this Monday. Uh, the basic pr uh, principles uh, that we share uh, in the review of the uh, security legislation is that, uh, first, uh, the pacifist uh, policies under the Constitution uh, will be uh, maintained and observed. Uh, that is, uh, we strictly limit the use of military force to the, to the defense of our country and would not exercise any form of force overseas, uh, nor would dispatch the, the self-defense force for the purpose 
of the exercising force uh, in order uh, to ensure this principle or the use of weapons by the self-defense force will be a strictly defined in control. Uh, second, uh, we, we would develop and maintain Japan's own defense capabilities uh, based on its exclu exclusively national defense oriented policy, uh, so uh, what we call the Senshu Boe uh, principle. And also, uh, we will maintain and strengthen the deterrence provided by the alliance with the US uh, in the region. And finally, uh, we will contribute proactively to peace and prosperity of the international community. Uh, based on these principles, uh, we have uh, agreed on uh, the uh, revision of the related security legislation. Uh, because of the limited time, we will not go into the details uh, of the, each legislation, but I would like to make uh, several comments, uh, which I think is important uh, for relations uh, with the United States. Uh, first, uh, we clarified uh, the authority uh, of the SDF to use weapons uh, in order to protect U.S. forces uh, and, its ac uh, and its assets uh, for the purpose of to, uh, for protecting U.S. armed forces and their uh, assets, uh, which are engaged in activities contributing to the security of Japan. Um, this measure uh, by the CEF, uh, SDF will be implemented under conditions uh, which is not uh, necessarily wartime. So uh, uh, this uh, new clause uh, that will be added to the, the SDF law uh, is therefore not considered as an exercise of collective self-defense, but rather or as a part of the SDF's police activities. And uh, second, we would uh, extend the logistic support and other non-combat activities in international uh, cooperation by proposing a new bill uh, so that the SDF could provide logistic support uh, to U.S. and the multinational forces engaged in activities for ensuring uh, peace and stability of the international community. Uh, and third, we would strengthen cooperation between the SDF and U.S. forces in emergency situations. Uh, we would revise uh, the current law of emergency situations in areas surrounding Japan, uh, the so-called Shuhenji Taiko, or to enable more effective support to U.S. forces engaged in activities contributing to peace and stability of Japan. And um, fourth uh, is one of the controversial issues uh, that is uh, discussed in Japan, but we would uh, allow oh, a limited exercise of collective self-defense by altering uh, the interpretation of Article 9 of the Constitution, uh, which uh, has been uh, interpreted as prohibiting uh, the exercise of collective self-defense force. Uh, this, uh, the situation that we would allow exercise of collective self-defense will be limited to a situation. Very strict limitation will be imposed. Uh, but as I have uh, mentioned before, uh, when the SDF force uh, would be in protecting the uh, U.S. forces which are in joint actions or, or when the, the SDF force is providing logistic support to the U.S. forces. There might be a situation that, uh, of course, the situation that we that is being anticipated is non-combat, is a peace, peacetime situation, uh, but it could develop uh, to a situation that could be an armed attack to one of the parties. In that case, uh, if, if, uh, the for, in protecting, each, uh, mutual protection might uh, extend uh, to be uh, exercise of collective self-defense. Therefore, uh, limited uh, exercise of collective defense force, uh, def collective self-defense uh, will be needed to fulfill our uh, cooperation uh, be between the US and Japan. These are the major points uh, of this new legislation. Of course, there are more details that have to be covered, but uh, uh, that they are the major uh, points that I would like to make. And probably the uh, bills will be presented in the, diet in, couple, in the coming couple of weeks and hope that we could uh, uh, be finalized uh, by the end of this session. Thank you.
Terrific. Thank you, Wade san Let me turn to former Defense Minister Onodera. Um, if you'd like to comment on what's been said so far, please do. But in particular, um, could you tell us about the regional dimension? You spend a lot of time as Defense Minister in uh, defense diplomacy with your counterparts in Asia. And um, I think you'll have a, a real insight for us on how these changes are viewed in Asia and what Japan uh, should do or can do uh, going forward. Last summer, I gave a speech here at CSIS as defense minister. Uh, let me once again thank you for uh, extending that opportunity to me. Looking at the uh, audience, I think uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, DPJ people, but also LDP. Uh, there's Mr. Nishimura, who is a future leader. Uh, please uh, keep your eyes on uh, him. Up to now, listening to this discussion on security, I imagine that um, some of the audience might have difficulty following some of this argument. Even uh, people in Japan have uh, difficulty understanding it sometimes, and it's hard to understand, explain it to uh, people abroad. What I felt as defense minister was that Japan's uh, security legislation is so complex. When we actually uh, mobilize a unit, we always, at every step of the way, have to think about, is this allowable, is it not allowable? And then uh, it's really tough to actually command a unit. So many of the um, MOD employees are always thinking about legal issues, actually. But when you think about our duty to protect Japan, there are uh, natural things that any country has to do. You have to protect your people, your territory, your seas. If you're attacked, you respond with uh, the use of force to protect the country and the people. Also, the US uh, forces are cooperating in the defense of Japan. Because of that, together with the US forces, we should protect various U.S. assets. This is nothing could be more natural. Also, if the international community, if the U.N. makes a request, then uh, various countries can come together. Then at the same level as other countries, or maybe at a slightly lower level, we should be able to make international contributions. It should be um, something that could we uh, should do as a matter of course. But this was not the case, and that is the aim this time. As Defense Minister, going to ASEAN countries, the ROK, China, meeting with uh, defense officials, myself or uh, my staff or uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs staff certainly explained all of these matters in a careful and uh, thorough manner. And no uh, problems were pointed out by uh, the uh, neighboring countries. It's basically Japan being responsible for Japanese policy so that there's no misunderstanding. This legislation does not aim at a particular country or at a particular situation. In many uh, situations, we have to be able to protect our country and our people. That's what this uh, set of uh, laws is uh, supposed to do. When we make our defense equipment plans for uh, the next 10 years, what kind of equipment will we uh, uh, procure? What kind of units will we create? We're always transparent about this. And before it's uh, announced, we uh, directly explain it to our neighbors, such as China and the ROK. Unfortunately, we can't do so to uh, North Korea, but we're always open about this and give a careful, thorough explanation. What's the main reason? It's because this is uh, deterrence to protect our own country. Asia is now the center of global growth. And 
and the U.S. economy and the European economy are also being helped by the economic growth in Asia. So it's very much in our interest to not see uh, any incident in Asia, to see any conflict in Asia. For that purpose, to keep that from happening, we have to uh, put in place the necessary legislation and also put in place uh, guidelines uh, for cooperation between the U.S. and Japan, which we were able to do. It was uh, my predecessor as Defense Minister, Mr. Morimoto, that uh, proposed the upgrade of the guidelines. He was a DPJ minister, I, an LDP a defense minister, but we have been consistent on defense policy. And that was, uh, the result of that was the just updated guidelines. So, this will strengthen the alliance, and the U.S. rebalance can only contribute to stability in Asia. Uh, and Asia's uh, development can uh, contribute to the U.S. economy. These are always our perspectives as uh, defense uh, officials. And as we go about explaining various issues to neighboring countries, we tell them that this is a domestic defense policy question in Japan. So I was never criticized by them for that. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you. And last, uh, let's turn to the next foreign minister. I'm, I'm not making an endorsement. That's his, that's his title. <laughs> um, Aki. Hi. Thanks so much for this uh, opportunity to speak. I'm the fifth panelist, so there are hardly any uh, points to cover and hardly any time left. I came to Washington uh, in July of last year. It's been about a year since I was here. And uh, so we... Uh, are still in the opposition, and that's uh, kind of tough. But let me, in uh, conclusion, say something that many of you may, uh, may not have heard very much. Mr. Maihara, Mr. Onodera talked about the revision of the guidelines and that it was uh, Minister Morimoto that proposed it in the first place. And as a vice minister, uh, I came to Washington under his instructions and um, met with Ashton Carter, who was deputy secretary at the time and is now secretary of defense, and uh, we reached agreement to move in that direction. So we do have uh, quite a bit of responsibility for the current uh, guidelines. What was our objective at the time? In the Asia-Pacific region, heat, peace, stability, and prosperity, we wanted to guarantee them over the long term. And we wanted to create a structure uh, centered uh, on the U.S. and Japan that would guarantee that. The U.S. rebalance policy, and an increase in Japan's role were something that we wanted to uh, pursue together. The rebalancing uh, strategy of the U.S. is something that's often talked about, but when it actually comes to implementation, it's a bit uh, iffy. Uh, is the emphasis shifting to Asia? Well, look at the chaos in the Middle East. There's trouble in the Ukraine, in, in Ukraine, uh, there's a lot of focus on Iran. So the U.S. forward presence in Asia is something we have to uh, take advantage of. It's good for the U.S., it's good for the countries of Asia. It is the uh, most uh, desirable outcome, as a matter of fact. The U.S. has had a hub-and-spoke uh, approach centered on the U.S. So there's a U.S.-Japan spoke, a U.S. ROK spoke, a U.S. Uh, Singapore, U.S. Australia, U.S. Philippines spoke, with uh, the uh, U.S. at the hub, like uh, like the wheel on a on a car. 
That's been the model. But the burden on the hub, on the United States, financially, is great, and also in terms operationally. So you keep the U.S. as a hub, but uh, the different spokes, such as uh, the Philippines, the ROK, the Vietnam, uh, Australia, uh, so instead of having a, um, a bunch of lines, we would have a surface. I've called it host region support. So each country would have host nation support to support the U.S. forward presence. But I uh, call it host region support for the region as a whole to work together. And I think that's the direction that the new guidelines are aimed at. And Japan wants to play a central role in that, in implementing it. The, what is the effort that lacks the most right now? It's how we manage Japan-ROK relations. Uh, two days ago, uh, Prime Minister Abe addressed Congress. And it's been uh, very favorable received in Washington, the speech, I think. And I listened to it on the uh, radio, and I also watched it later on uh, YouTube. Uh, he was uh, gesturing grandly and so forth. But I think that uh, it sent out a pretty good message. But uh, only the uh, South Koreans were quite uh, tough in their criticism. So how do we manage uh, Japan and ROK relations? In mid-June, I believe that President Park is uh, going to visit. And the U.S. has given a lot of advice, I think, about improving relations. I hear Mike is on his way to Korea. The next month and a half for Japan and the RK and the U.S. will be an important time for man managing trilateral relations, I believe. Prime Minister Abe gave such a speech in the U.S. We're going to be de debating uh, security legislation in Japan. Within that context, we have to solidify relations between Japan and uh, South Korea. And so move away from hub and spoke to a, a, a more of a planar uh, uh, host region support. I'm in opposition now. And so I would uh, really want to see a, um, a tough debate on this in the, the, the diet. But as uh, to the overall uh, uh, direction, uh, we, are, we are on the same page. <laughs> Um, Nagashima-san first, first wrote this proposal for host regional support when we were together at uh, Council on Foreign Relations 17 years ago. Yes. <laughs> and the rest of the world is starting to catch up, finally, to that <laughs> idea. Um, Sunohara-san has given me some extra time, so we can take a few questions from the audience. Um, and I believe we have microphones, so please raise your hand and <clears throat> if you have a question. And if not, I will. Uh, but we'd welcome questions from the floor. Let me, let me ask a question then. Um, Maihara-san uh, said, uh, like Nagashima-san, that the uh, opposition parties, at least the DPJ, shares the direction and the goal of these new defense guidelines, but had three concerns, um, uh, whether the, 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 the mission um, really fit the needs, um, whether the self-defense forces really had the capabilities, and then, of course, uh, winning support from the public. <clears throat> so I'd like to ask um, our LDP colleagues, uh, beginning with EYSON, how do you think you can address these concerns in um, either the legislation or in implementation going forward? Well, before I talk about the guidelines, the purpose of the security uh, legislation, how did we set this up? As I mentioned earlier, conceive all conceivable situations we want to be able to deal with. 
and that's what's needed in creating legislation. You don't try uh, to look at uh, possibility and so forth. So even cases that probably may never happen have to be included in what you contemplate in creating seamless legislation. It's important for Japan's crisis management. So based on that, for example, U.S.-Japan exercises, I think uh, their content is going to change in the future. Through those sorts of things, the U.S.-Japan alliance will become stronger, I think. And we'll have to show that to the international community. The alliance's deterrence will be enhanced. And as Ms. Mr. Orondera said, this will contribute to the peace and stability of Asia and of the world, even more so than up to now. Both Japan and the U.S.-Japan alliance will do so. The, that's what we were thinking about in preparing the, this draft legislation. It's true that the self-defense forces might lack capabilities uh, in certain areas right now. But we have to contemplate all possible scenarios, and I think that we can uh, coordinate with the United States to bring up our capabilities at the current point. Uh, does the self-defense forces have power projection uh, capability? Well, there are a lot of things that we can't do right now. But within the capability that we do have, how do we contribute to the stability of the region and of the world? That's the perspective from which we approached preparing the draft. For Japan to exercise force would only be when our uh, security uh, was seriously affected or threatened. It's limited to that. This law, this legislation does not at all allow use of force in any other situations. So neighboring countries and the international community will receive uh, uh, thorough explanations of this uh, from us. As to building up uh, the self-defense forces uh, capabilities, I think that it's at uh, quite a good level. Now, we have various uh, new uh, piece of equipment, and they can, it's normal for them to be connected to the countries of, other, to the equipments of other countries. For example, uh, Japanese radar can contribute to missile defense systems of other countries, and missile defense systems of uh, Aegis ships uh, are connected across uh, different national forces. It's not just one country or one ship that is uh, protecting us. The uh, basic way of doing it is that always this is being done as a team. That's also part of our uh, legislation. So uh, US ships that are protecting Japan, for example, under certain conditions, the self-defense forces will be able to protect them. And of course, uh, that is something that uh, directly affects Jap Japan's security. So we have contemplated all those cases in creating this draft legislation. And it's also closely linked to the uh, new U.S.-Japan guidelines. So the new guidelines have a lot more uh, connectivity contemplated. Uh, I uh, see these new guidelines in that light. Um, we've taken enough time from the next panel, so let me conclude by, by, uh, by just saying that um, in 2000, um, Rich Armitage, Joe Nye, and a number of us uh, issued a report, and one of the things we said is the era of gaiatsu, of external pressure, is, is over. And if you look at the uh, decision on collective self-defense, the defense guidelines, um, these are issues the U.S. has a strong national interest in, 
and has been discussing for many, many decades. But this most recent iteration was generated in Japan by the Democratic Party of Japan and then by the, by the Abe government. <clears throat> and um, one thing we should never forget is that the strength of our alliance is our common democratic value system and the people support is necessary, is indispensable for our alliance. And um, everybody at this table is working hard uh, and will be working hard to, to uh, get that support and to um, explain and adjust uh, so that the Japanese people are confident in uh, this decision. And in the US, we, um, we have to respect that. And we also have to really appreciate that you explained to us some of the issues that will come up. So uh, please join me in thanking our panel, and then we'll invite the next panel up. Just one more point on the understanding of the public. The uh, security debates in the past differ uh, from uh, the recent uh, debate and that we have more and more of the Japanese public that are forward-looking on defense issues. It just shows how much the uh, Japanese public has a deep interest in security matters. And through the deliberations in the diet between the parties in power and the opposition, I think that this uh, public understanding will be deepened. like an arrow and time is running out and let me start quickly. Uh, my name is Tsuyoshi Sunohara. I'm, uh, I'm sitting down here as, not as a Nikkei Washington correspondent, something like that, working for Nikkei newspaper, but as a Secretary General for US Japan Project at J JSA, Japan Center for Economic Research. So I'd like to make a correction. Nikkei is not associated with this kind of initiative. Nikkei is not, Nikkei is just one of the sponsors for this uh, new initiative, which we call Mount Fuji Dialogue, uh, which was launched last year uh, to enhance intellectual exchange and dialogues between American experts and Japanese friends. And uh, this delegation from Japan very much distinguished people from LDP and the Komei Party, as well as DPJ, are uh, uh, formed as a team under the name of this Mount Fuji Dialogue. So now having said that, I'd like to introduce uh, my uh, Japanese uh, uh, mentor, Dr. Kitaoka and Dr. Morimoto. And uh, as an unspoken consensus between me and Dr. Kitaoka, when you are in Rome, uh, do as Romans do, which means this, this is Washington DC and we are supposed to speak in English. But uh, I see many familiar faces and friends from Japan and Japanese faces. So let me speak from this point in Japanese. And to American friends, would you please uh, listen to our very capable interpreters back there. So we've had uh, some uh, politician friends discussing various uh, issues, but uh, I'd like to um, uh, talk about, about uh, if you say it the, uh, in, in soccer terms, the two top uh, uh, wise men, shall we say, are uh, Professors Kiroka and Morimoto. And so would like to have uh, these wise men talk about the recent uh, security environment and uh, the guidelines and the uh, uh, upcoming security legislation. So Professor Kitoka, please. It's really tough that I'm not allowed to speak in English. The Mount Fuji dialogue, I think, has a great significance in that uh, academics, politicians, and businessmen come together in Japan and not 
just politicians from one party. That would have been impossible 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. We didn't ha yet have a DPJ. So, Marha uh, san, Nagashiva san, had not yet had the uh, experience of government. So, I think that was great to be able to have a, such a bipartisan participation. Now, if uh, People from the U.S. came. We used to have uh, a bipartisan uh, breakfast and so forth. But I was really glad about this Mai Fuji uh, dialogue. Now, a lot has already been covered. Let me take a different perspective. And it comes up in the press once in a while, constitutional revision. People are concerned about possible revision. Why is that? I think, I think that uh, revising the Constitution is actually a, um, it's the first right of a democratic people. So people that are against any revision, I think, are totalitarians. They're not democratics. Second, concerns are being expressed even in the U.S., and I'm not happy about that either. Why? This constitution was designed to punish Japan six months after the end of the world so that Japan would never again become a dangerous country. It's uh, against international law, and it's against the Potsdam Declaration for an occupying power to create a constitution. But there were several issues, and let me deal with them. In spite of that, I think that our current constitution is much better than the imperial constitution. The uh, uh, symbolic uh, 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 imperial household and so forth. Um, and uh, the uh, parliamentary system and so forth. But there are problems, such as Article 9. Many Japanese uh, have uh, uh, misunderstanding too. But Article 9 has two sections. One, one mustn't resolve international conflicts with uh, force peacefully. Some politicians are kind of odd and uh, oppose that, but most people think it's just normal. If you oppose that, then you would have to um, renounce membership in the UN. So um, Article 9, Paragraph 1 is uh, not challenged by anyone. It's, it's important. The problem is the second part of Article 9 is to not have uh, our armed our forces. But uh, Japan actually started with its police reserve. And in 1954, we reached the uh, interpretation that it is possible to have a minimal uh, amount of, uh, of armed forces prepared. But when we talk about revising the Constitution, I'm uh, rather moderate. But they tell them, uh, they talk about them as um, people that are trying to change uh, Article 9, which is uh, designed to uh, keep the peace or something like that, the uh, pacifistic uh, article. And I think that to describe people's uh, position that way is uh, cannot be forgiven as a um, uh, an academic. So it's Article 9, uh, uh, Paragraph 2 that needs to be changed. And it's not uh, hardly anyone that uh, would uh, uh, talk about Article 9, Paragraph 1. It's important for even the Japanese people to understand this point. Looking at the Japanese media, it's not just they uh, are uh, not very clear about international relations. This also goes for history. I'm working now. Uh, on looking back at the 20th and 21st, 20th century in order to create the 21st century. Uh, I uh, am the acting uh, chair for this. I can't remember the full name of this group, one of the things I'm working on. But in the pre-war era, Japan uh, uh, challenged the international order with force. It was a huge er error, and it didn't, it didn't work. We try to uh, 
increase our territory by force. And we went in the wrong direction. There were others that opposed that and uh, wanted to keep the international order. But post-war, Japan has benefited from uh, free trade and open economies. So we can trade freely. Force cannot uh, u be used to solve disputes. I think that's a really important system. And I think that's the most important thing about Japan is that you don't uh, solve uh, disputes by force. And we will keep a free, open economic system. That's allowed Japan to develop. But if we develop this much, then we have to uh, start upholding the order. We used to be uh, a challenger to the order, and we have to uh, reflect on that and rather move to uh, make efforts to support the order. I think that is the biggest point in this current legislation. Is that about how much time I have? We don't have a, a, a much time, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, right now, uh, in the beginning, uh, I uh, mentioned that uh, I am a public uh, social uh, foundation, uh, so that was good. So please, uh, Mr. Morimoto. Now, at 18, he went to the Defense University, and was responsible for uh, defense matters, not just as an academic. And Article 5 uh, talks of our treaty, talks about uh, uh, areas under the administration of Japan being attacked are a threat to peace and security. And the meaning, the significance of the U.S.-Japan alliance is that Japan is responsible for Japan's defense, but Japan is not responsible for the defense of the U.S. It's uh, lopsided. It's amazing that such a treaty was uh, concluded, I always thought. But then I entered the uh, security uh, division of the MOFA, and learned about how weighty Article 6 was. So Article 5 is Jap the U.S. protecting Japan, but Article 6 is uh, Japan providing facilities and areas. It's in return for that. So it's sharing the pain, shall we say. One makes up for the other. And I thought to myself, aha, so uh, that's how the treaty was set up. And I really felt that uh, strongly. And it was uh, my, uh, my life's work uh, ever since then to deal with these uh, matters. We're not close to an equal partnership, but, and why is that? Under international law, the exercise of collective self defense, the UN Charter. Uh, Article 51 outlines uh, the right to collective self-defense. We can't exercise that right in the same conditions as other countries. So when you think about those two things, we're pretty close to an equal partnership. But from the U.S. perspective, uh, the U.K. and NATO allies uh, are at a different level than Japan is, for example. As uh, Mr. Iwaya said earlier, you know, the right of self, the collective self-defense can be exercised only for uh, the defense of uh, Japan. If we wanted to do full-scale uh, collective self-defense, we would have to revise the Constitution. That is what the uh, Legal Affairs uh, Bureau person is saying. I'm thinking that we're maybe about halfway there. It's been pretty much improved, and the U.S.-Japan alliance is in a new stage. We have uh, turned a, a page. I don't know how 
much uh, uh, life there is yet to live, but uh, I'd like to keep making efforts to uh, do, do the other half. And I think uh, that's how I see this, um, this, set of, this set of new guidelines. For Japan uh, to voluntarily revise its constitution and uh, truly uh, become a uh, nation that can exercise uh, the right to collective self-defense. I've never felt that the U.S. has tried to force this. It's rather that uh, the U.S. wanted a lot of logistical support, such as refueling, transport, those are the sorts of things that the U.S. expressed interest in. And so domestically, we had a debate on uh, CSD and have always answered no to U.S. requests. In the previous panel, it was talked about that we hope that the U.S. doesn't think that uh, Japan is now able to fully exercise the right to CSD. I am slightly concerned about that, too, because it's not the case. It's under limited conditions. Under those limited conditions, we can provide rather broad support, but it's not the same sort of uh, CSD as uh, is uh, widely uh, practiced uh, by other countries under international law. We're not yet there. So we very much hope that uh, this will be correctly understood abroad. We hope that um, excessive uh, expectations based on a uh, wrong interpretation will not result in disappointment by the U.S. We're glad that Japan has finally made it this far, and we hope that uh, that feeling will be shared. And so my immediate goal is to see cooperation uh, done along those lines under uh, the new guidelines. How do we strengthen reliance? How do we increase our uh, defensive capability? That's not all there is to talk about. When you think about the U.S. rebalance, it's not just the U.S.-Japan. It's the U.S.-Japan-Australia, U.S.-Japan-India, U.S.-Japan-ROK. Trilateral or multilateral cooperation can be uh, harnessed uh, with the U.S., Japan, and Japan at the core taking leadership to contribute to the security of the region. The U.S. and Japan will not do everything alone. Uh, we would like to have as many uh, partners as possible with countries that share our values. Getting them uh, closer to our uh, shores with the U.S. and Japan as at the center. With, uh, first of all, trilateral with countries such as the ROK, Australia, and India. And then uh, the ASEAN countries and other uh, countries are uh, countries we would like to try to make efforts to bring them as close as possible to our shores. These guidelines do represent a new stage that allows uh, greater than ever before cooperation by Japan. And I think it's a, an epoch-making uh, uh, step that we haven't seen for 50 years. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in the beginning, I mentioned that uh, uh, this time uh, we have uh, initiated the Mount Fuji dialogue, as Mr. Dr. Kataoga said. Uh, not only academics, but also bureaucracies and some other political circles. Uh, we wanted to convey the Japanese voice to the United States and allies. Uh, the message is uh, we are committed 
uh, to the promotion of uh, alliance, and uh, that is not only for the uh, uh, Japan, but for the region and the world, and uh, promote uh, safe and stability. So that is why uh, we have this, uh, secured the collaboration from the economic uh, business circles. Uh, so uh, Mr. Maihara, Mr. Uh, Gemba, Mr. Uh, eh, Onodera, and other people, Mr. Nagashima, uh, all joined in the same team. And uh, uh, there are uh, American uh, participants and uh, uh, Japanese uh, participants, also some other uh, representatives from other countries. But especially, I like to emphasize to the Japanese audience that uh, uh, you know some of you maybe uh, feel kind of awkward uh, because uh, you know Japan is now being viewed as uh, you know kind of uh, uh, shifting towards the left, uh, right. Uh, but however, that is not a reality, and uh, uh, Mr. Kataoka and Mr. Morimoto both uh, respectively uh, giving a very important uh, advisors uh, for the uh, Democratic Party and also uh, LDP. Uh, uh, starting this point, I like to uh, hear your questions uh, from the uh, audience. As many questions as possible uh, we like to receive. So those who like to ask a, a question, please raise a hand and uh, wait for the mic and also uh, mention your affiliation and then give a question, please. Thank you. I'm Lee Boliu of Voice of America. Americans have fought two major wars recently. Uh, have, the Ameri uh, have Japanese thought about the, uh, perhaps the possibility that Amer uh, Americans may not come to Japan's aid if Senkaku is under attack, if the Japanese lawmakers do not move aggressively to pass the uh, necessary legislation by the summer? Thank you. ドクター<笑> Uh, what do you think about that? Um, Stanley Kober. Um, yesterday, the Chinese Defense Ministry announced that it would be sending three warships to the Mediterranean to hold exercises with the Russian Navy. Are we now seeing the emergence of two global alliances? Thank you. Uh, let me start with the Senkakus. They are uh, Japan's inherent territory, historically, legally, no room for doubt. In 1971, China, uh, China claimed uh, the Senkaku, and they've always uh, started uh, to, the ships have approached, especially in uh, 2010. Uh, I was uh, defense uh, minister, but um, now it's because the uh, coast, co the coast guard was uh, nationalized. But it's not really um, 
It was starting September 14th, uh, two and a half years ago. Ever since then, three or four government ships uh, come once a week uh, near the line and um, uh, once a month into our territorial wildsies. In no November of 2013, they uh, created the ADIZ. And airplanes have started to come in recent. And we have responded with scrambles. Last fiscal year, starting uh, April 1st of last year to uh, March 31st of this year, it was more than 460 times. So China is trying to take the similar sequence that they took in the South China Seas in the Senkagus, starting with fishermen, armed fishermen, and they'll be backed up with government ships and uh, naval ships supporting them, uh, giving them food, medicine, and to try to create a uh, de facto uh, uh, occupation. If that were happening, um, our Coast Guard and uh, police are uh, patrolling our territory. But even if they were to come, it would not be considered as uh, the use of force. So would we respond with uh, uh, the uh, uh, with police forces? There would be cases where the self-defense forces would go, but not by using force. We would use the self-defense forces for policing activities. In this case, they would not be uh, doing activities for the defense of Japan. If they were actually attacked with force, then Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance would be activated. Uh, it's very encouraging that the U.S. has said that uh, this applies, but the process that goes up to there, primarily, it is Japan's uh, unique responsibility to protect our own territory. Will the U.S. help us or help not help us? Before we even think about that, first, Japan itself has a strong responsibility, a sense of that, to protect its territory and is increasing its capability for that and is first needs to be able to uh, have the will to do so. And what's necessary for that is that we shouldn't unnecessarily provoke China. We can't uh, unleash the SDF just because one uh, ship came in. That's what China wants. So even if there's a mistake, then we can't have an excessive reaction. We cannot uh, be seen as provocative. Whatever action we're faced with, we have to apply the law and um, be cautious. In spite of that, we, the U.S. public opinion, Japanese public opinion, the U.S. Congress, if everyone thought that we had to help Japan, then the president might send U.S. troops. But until then, Japan has to protect our territory uh, with our own capability and under our own responsibility. I think that's all there is to be said about that. Thanks very much, Mr. Kitaoka. The second question is terribly tough. Uh, you have to think about it on various fronts. First of all, uh, politicians, it's often said, oh, we'd like to do this, but we can't because of a lack of public support. I wish you'd stop saying that. If uh, you did just what the people want, then you wouldn't need politics. So. If you have a, uh, I'd like for you to uh, be um, courageous in uh, 
making making policy, uh, even if there's a risk of you losing your seat. No, we at the McGraw Hill textbook issue. It's not as if we will uh, intervene with force, but the content of this textbook is just uh, crazy. I think uh, some uh, LDP people have said do something, and um, and Mofa did something, and it could uh, be counterproductive. So we should avoid this and be patient, and have. Uh, uh, academics taken care of by academics. Uh, the Nikkei is great, of course, but there are some media outlets in Japan that are not so great. I don't think that we're worse than other countries, though. I won't name countries, but even the U.S. media is pretty bad. Same thing in the U.K. I mean, that's the, the way things are. So. If there is a mistake, then we'll just have to point it out. So to say people trying to change Article 9, I think that's odd. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't label people that way. So there are people that quote uh, me as saying Japan should apologize for wars of aggression. I've never said that. And I, I, when they say that, I just uh, have them uh, uh, correct it. So I don't, I'm not excessive in my uh, reaction, but TV is, a, is harder. If you look at uh, television commentators, so um, it looks like uh, really some of it is before uh, Perry came with his black ships, some of the commentary. But there can be uh, scandals and uh, silly uh, um, reporting if that's done by newspapers that they don't sell as much really looking at the internet I think it's an open uh, place for discussion I think that we should make it uh, obligatory to use a real name when you comment on the internet because uh, otherwise uh, people are careless in their remarks, they're uh, vulgar in their remarks, they're not uh, responsible. I think that you have to be responsible for speech. And so uh, the internet, how much has it worsened relations between Japan and South Korea and Japan and China? A lot. I think that that should be taken up as an international issue. Earlier, there was a question that I uh, uh, failed to uh, answer. China and Russia, in many places, especially in the uh, Far East, are doing uh, various uh, joint exercises. It's not limited to today. They've done so ever since the end of the Cold War. What are they after? I think they have two goals. Looking at the U.S. rebalance, they want to respond, uh, show a military response to that. They want to uh, show um, in the various countries of Asia that China and Russia are militarily close. This might be in the mutual interest of China and Russia. If you look at the content of these joint exercises, they increase the skills of their uh, troops. They also have uh, cooperation in terms of uh, equipment. And they can invite third countries to join. So diplomatically, the, both countries can play a card against the United States as well. I think they have uh, diplomatic uh, aims as well. The U.S. and Japan don't need to be worried about every single exercise and uh, have a specific response to every single one. I think that's very clear. Thanks very much. I'd like to have another round.
Please raise your hand if you have a question. Hello, uh, Justin Dunnicliffe, United States Department of Defense. Um, I would like to know how public opinion will play a role in shaping changes for national security policy for Japan, if it will be influential or if political change can come without it. CSIS で客員研究員をしております、ワグリと申します。My name is Waguri.、Uh, I'm a researcher at CSIS. We're here.、Uh, actually, there are、uh, you know, my kind of senior、uh, boss, former senior boss. But uh, uh, I like to、uh, ask about the、uh, uh, review of the.、Uh, uh, Uh, national security uh, legislations. Uh, if uh, you have uh, any opinion uh, regarding, uh, you know, as a next step,、uh, in which direction uh, the uh, change should be guided.、Uh, for example, uh, the, there have been uh, uh, collective uh, defense uh, being a key word, but uh, uh, my, my personal opinion. Most of the、uh, activities can be conducted without a、uh, framework of uh, uh, collective uh, self defense.、Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kitaoka has been advocated that the、uh, establishment of the legal framework that can be、uh, compatible and responsible for the international security system. So, if you have any comments,、uh, please.、Uh, Uh, give me.、Uh, any other questions?、Uh, I'm、uh, Inazawa with the Ritzmeikan University. I have a question to Dr. Kitagawa.、Uh, Dr. Kitagawa has been uh, always uh, you know, studying about uh, 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 military relationship. Uh, so, uh, the uh, How the、uh, national diet is going to、uh, make a commitment to the uh, uh, reorganization of the self defense force and uh, things? Uh, so, I'd like to know how、uh, this is going to be played out. On public opinion and policymaking. We have the Nikkei CSS、uh, virtual think tank that uh, Nikkei uh, does、uh, cooperative with Mike Green. So, for example,、uh, we did a poll on 3,000、uh, Japanese businessmen on、uh, Japan China relations. And so,、uh, Mr.、Um, Morimoto didn't、uh, say, don't use the word national. Nationalization, but 56% uh, supported it of the uh, um, the Senkaku Islands, and about 70% oppose、uh, the Prime Minister visiting Yasukuni. So I think that、uh, the Japanese public,、uh, their sense of balance is, is, is really uh, um, on, on target. It's,、uh, Something of a silent、uh, majority. And I think that、uh, we do、um, respond sensitively to that. So I don't think there will be any extreme shifts. So will Japan expand dramatically because of the new legislation? No, I don't think that's possible. It's because the public doesn't support it. There's also、uh, something like a generational change. I'll be 54 this year as a child. Every day there were right wingers. That came to our、um, elementary school saying, Give us back the Northern Territories, don't forgive Russia. But no,、uh, Jiang Zemin from、uh, China and、uh, the ROK、uh, has anti uh, Japanese uh, uh, education, but we had anti Russia、uh, education. But at a KO di-、uh, University, Poll.、Um, so we said、uh, 90% of the、uh, students said well, we might as well、uh, improve Russia relations, don't worry about getting all the territory. But 
uh, China's, uh, uh, but uh, looking at the, those 70 above, they were saying that uh, we couldn't trust Russia at all. So I think this generational change uh, might affect uh, policy making as well. Second question, maybe uh, you could address. Last May, I made a proposal, not just me, my study group. And the government didn't uh, incorporate it. I think that was too bad, because in uh, Article 9, uh, Paragraph 1, it says that uh, international conflicts mustn't be uh, s solved with uh, the use of force. It's not just um, international uh, conflicts uh, in general. It's uh, ones that affect Japan. There's no other way to interpret it. But the um, Cabinet Legal of Affairs Office is saying, no, this r r applies to just uh, uh, the international con armed conflicts generally. So I was most dissatisfied with that. What uh, role should Japan play? And then we have to protect Japan. And the center of all this is the US-Japan Security Treaty. But it's not so much legislation as it is policy. So as I earlier said that Japan has to be more supportive of the international order. We're doing a lot of things for human security, for example, around the world. Like at the Mount Fuji Dialogue last year, Ebola took a, a surprising amount of the uh, debate. I mean, people got really excited about what Japan could do for that. I wondered, Japan is not doing as much as it could. Japan has to be aware that it is a global, global player and to pr pursue policies along that line. This also ties in with public opinion. Mr. Waguri in 95 did uh, uh, worked on uh, UN Security Council reform, but the Security Council actually worsened because of that. But I think that we have to fundamentally revise the way we uh, look at these uh, issues. The third point, I, I think that Mr. Morimoto really wants to answer that. It's not so much that. I really don't <laughs> want to answer, but I suppose it's my job too. Security legislation will be worked on by the politicians uh, here in the room with us. And I very much hope that thanks to their efforts, it, it will be passed. And I think that a majority of the public in Japan shares my view. On the one hand, for the self-defense forces, uh, they are the implementers. Once the law is passed, the next day, they'll be given the duty. Can you do it? I was the minister, so, and for a long period, I was uh, a member of the self-defense forces. The answer would be no, no, they cannot. But what's the most important thing? Well, there are two. The self-defense forces and the MOD look at the law. They will have to create a system they will be able to create the uh, implementation of the law. They don't also don't have the posture necessary. Logistics includes uh, transport, supply, uh, facilities, equipment. Um, we don't, we've never had the sort of bu budget to do all of that. Now, for example, search and rescue, if uh, the SDF were asked to do that, they would be able to do that the next day. But providing the, the facilities would be private sector facilities, hospitals, ports, airports. And when it comes to supply, we will be supplying. It's different than transport. Transport and supply are fundamentally different because it depends who is responsible for the uh, goods is different. Br bringing something from A to B is transport. But let's say we don't have something, uh, uh, give it to me, 
then you have to have excess to order to give it. We don't have anything that's excess. Our budget only allows for the bare minimum. So it's actually not having a surplus. It's having an adequate uh, structure in place. So we need a system. We need a posture. In cases, we need ROE, rules of engagement. All of these would have to be changed. Training manuals would have to be changed. And then the actual training would have to be done. In ca certain cases, um, would have to have joint training with uh, US troops returning from uh, Afghanistan so that people could really be able to carry out uh, high-risk missions. We need time and experience to re improve the level of our uh, SDF members. It's not just their skills. It's also their mindset. It's also the mindset of the public. If the risks are higher, then the Japan to make necessary contributions with the U.S. to the international computer will have to do such things, will have to be, expose itself to risks. It will have to think of that as being part of uh, what we have to do. Will we be able to do it? It's not just one session of the diet that will accomplish it. That's what's most important in my mind. On equipment, the current uh, diet uh, would like to revise the uh, law and create a law that might be called something like uh, the law uh, to create the uh, acquisitions uh, um, and technology development agency, something like DARPA. I don't know what it would be called exactly uh, for the transfer of technology. And we are m making progress on that, but uh, we're, we're not there yet. Let's say a private company. There's a, a lot of uh, uh, reports in the press about in India wanting US too. They'd like to have licensed production. Of, so they'd like for all of the small parts manufacturers in Japan to come to India. That's not going to be feasible. They'll just make two of them and say, well, it'll, it'll be Indian, and then sell it to third countries. That sort of cooperation is something we're negotiating on, but it's just not feasible. And they're saying, uh, give us uh, uh, self-defense force people for years uh, for training. There's no law that would allow that. We have nothing such as the foreign military sales legislation in the U.S. So even if we try to create contracts, will we be able to um, transfer Japanese technology? No. The law alone will not be enough. This is a field where we have done nothing for 50 years after the war, and we're trying to enter it for the first time. There was a question for me, too, so let me uh, touch on that. And uh, it has on uh, the research that I've conducted uh, on relations between the government and the uh, military. Um, it's not like uh, the opposition asking the government. It's I wouldn't say that it's taboo, but they try to avoid it. Uh, all of you politicians here have been both in power and in opposition, but listening to that, uh, I wonder what would you do? Now, politics in the first place is a choice between which is better. So is it 100% perfect? It's not uh, an error. So we've done that for 55, since the 55 years. We, we have to have a debate uh, that uh, gives uh, uh, more than one option. It's not good for public debate either. As Mr. Morimoto says, even though we pass various laws, we've uh, re revising them because we've said that uh, there are uh, problems with interpretation up to now. But once you do that, then you get a budget, you buy uh, equipment, and you train them. 
Now, I think that um, among the main uh, countries of the world, our uh, military is the most difficult to operate. The essence of military affairs is its unpredictability and technological advancement. In 1905, we won the uh, war with Russia, and the Manchuria incident was 1931, and Pearl Harbor was 1941. So it's in 36 years, so there were uh, oil, uh, uh, submarines, uh, airplanes that were uh, played a big role there, but all of this has changed a lot in, in that period. And so I think we, we, there's no time to waste, and the public needs to be aware of that. Thanks very much. We're uh, very uh, we're over time. Uh, that concludes our second panel. <laughs> Give everyone a round of applause. Um, thank you for uh, bearing with us. We went over a little bit. It's going to be an interesting couple of months. On the one hand, the understanding of the Japanese people is important. On the other hand, uh, we need to create a system, as uh, Morimoto Sansei said, that is effective and credible and operationally useful. Um, and uh, these guys will have to find a way to bridge that. Uh, those two islands, and we wish them the best of luck. So thank you very much. <laughs>